There are a few topics that I've ever encountered that cause as much controversy and polarizing opinions as when you say, what do you think of the environment? What are the issues? What's the problem? And I've read a lot, and in my research I found people that will give me amazing statistics and tell me exactly who to blame, and then I read some more and I find there's a different group of people or multiple groups of people that will tell me all those people are wrong and they give me a whole different set of statistics, and I mean it is like heat, heat, heat. In fact, um, as I read, I, I started to jot down sort of some major different perspectives that different groups have. I mean, just to get my arms around this. I put them on the front of your teaching handout. Pull that out and follow along. And I'm just going to go through. These are actual perspectives people have on the environment. And then as I kind of read through these, I'd like you to think about, so what's, what's mine? What do I really think? Uh, one group says the real issue with the environment is whether global warming is happening or not. That's the deal. Another group says, no, 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 no. Uh, tree huggers and environmentalists, they're liberal, new age folks seeking to thwart economic progress and prosperity. Another group says, no, I, that's not really it. The problem we're in today is a direct result of do dominion dogma taught for centuries from Genesis chapter 1. It's those Christians and their teaching and what they've said that has caused this idea of subduing the planet. Well, they've subdued it all right. Another group says the whole environment debate is overblown. This is a religious group. The Bible says it's all going to burn anyway, so don't worry about it. Uh, yet another group says the earth is our sacred mother, and it's the equal giver of life of all species. And so all species should be protected equally. And so this is sort of a pantheistic, uh, the earth is in fact God. And then finally, the... Uh, Sort of the skeptic or pragmatist is the going green movement in business and government is just a sham to exercise undue control and increase profits. Now, I don't know about you, but if you would just read through those and realize they're all over the map and they conflict one another radically. And so I would ask you, so if I put a microphone in front of you and then they put a camera and we we're going to broadcast this to the world and I said, okay. Those are a lot of different views. What do you believe about the environment? What are your convictions? What's true? What's false? What's right? How should we live and why? And your answer would be, well, here's a confession. Uh, up until recently, although you know I've sort of had a general position, I know God made the earth, uh, I recycle, I put my thermostat high, you know, when I looked at all these different opinions, what I realized, maybe what I needed to do, and so I thought it might be good for you too, maybe I need to really ask and answer the question, how as a follower of Jesus Christ do I need to think and act and respond with regard to the environment? And maybe the best place to start, rather than all those heated views, is at least just do the basics and back up and say, what does God say about the environment? I mean, what, what does the Bible actually teach about the environment? And then kind of take that for sure truth and apply it to all these different issues that we're faced day in and day out. So if you'll open your teaching handout, I, I want you to go on a journey with me, and I'm just going to tell you, it's a fairly recent journey. I have never done, uh, I'm a little bit ashamed to say this, I've never done a study of Scripture just for the environment all by itself. I've alluded to it in different things over the years. And so as I begin to read, I thought, okay, if, if I had to boil it down to six absolute things that the Bible says for sure about the environment, about our responsibility to it, here's six things I know for sure as kind of the basis or the grid to make wise decisions in terms of how I'm going to respond to all those different views. Number one is the earth belongs to God. It's foundational. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, he established it on the waters. In essence, when you start with Scripture and the truth, God says, The earth is mine. Everything in it is mine. 
And therefore, since I'm God and I made it, it's spiritual and it's important and it matters and you can't just blow off this issue. This really, really matters. The implication is we're to honor God's creation. We're to honor God's creation. Now, if you would, op open your Bibles because we're going to be there in just a second. Just the very, very first page. All right, Genesis chapter 1, just how it opens. The very first thing we learn from the Bible is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on in chapters 1 and 2 to talk about that process. And keep your finger there because we'll be back there in a minute. But we're to honor God because he made it. He created it. Not only did he create it, but as he created, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good, is it is good. And then later he will take the pinnacle of creation, which is you and me, and he'll say it's very good. So how do you honor God? He's the greatest artist, and he's the greatest architect who's infinite, who's all-wise, who's all-powerful, and who's all-knowing. And one of the great ways we honor him is we respect what he has made, we study what he has made, and we give him honor and credit and praise for the beauty and the provision that he's made for us. The earth is valuable, it is precious, it's irreplaceable, and here's a word you might jot down. It's sacred. It's not just a piece of land. It's not just air to breathe. God made it. It's sacred. Um, a trite illustration, but it kind of brought it into focus for me. Early in our marriage, uh, I was working for a guy and um, doing some part-time jobs. I was doing some other things. And Teresa and I were going to have a, a, a getaway weekend. And we were very poor. And he was my boss. And he was pretty wealthy. And he knew all about it. And so the day that I was going to get away, it was like a Friday for a weekend, he pulls up and he goes, hey, I have a little gift for you to really enjoy your time. And this will date me, but that's okay. And so he pulls up, and if you can remember, it was like the first or second year the 280Z came out. And it was a silver, hottest sports car going at the time. It was super fast. These kind of, It was like being in the cockpit of an airplane and... He hands these keys to me and goes, I want you and your wife to have a really good time. My first thought was, if I wreck this car, I'll die, and it's my boss. And then the second was, I probably should test this to make sure it's going to be okay for, for me and my wife on this trip. And so, boy, I punched that thing a few times, and like, whoa, this is like way too much fun. And so then, you know, so she get in, and we, you know, wow, here I am, and going down the road, and I feel really cool. And, and so then we get to this little place, and I think, i got to park where someone's not near it. You know, if, what if a door hits it? Or Here's my point. My boss gave me something precious and sacred that I, it was for me, for my pleasure, that I felt a tremendous weight of responsibility to both enjoy it and not mess it up. How much more? How much more? God thinks that way about the earth and the planet that he's entrusted to you and me, which is... The second point, God appointed mankind dominion over the earth. Psalm 115, 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. Underline the word belong and encircle the word given. He's given to man. So God says, I've created this, but I've created it in the highest heavens, and I'm the creator. I've given this to man. Well, what's that mean? Here's the implication. We are the earth's vice regents. We're the caretaker, we're the managers, we're the stewards. He says, I've created all this, but I'm putting you in charge. If, if you're still in Genesis 1, skip down to verse uh, 28. It says, God blessed them, speaking of mankind, be fruitful and increase in numbers, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves to the ground. Those two key words are subdue and rule. They're very strong Hebrew words. They're used elsewhere for taking absolute control. They're very powerful words. It's God says, I gave you this earth. You are the executive vice president of this planet. You're the vice regents. You're the caretaker. You're in charge. And so there's a real sense of authority and power and do well with this earth. Cultivate it. Develop it. Grow it. Tame it is the idea. 
Now, unfortunately, those strong words taken out of context by some of our ancestors in some present day have made it out that we can just do with the earth whatever. It's just made for us, and we can treat it any way we want to meet our needs for whatever we want to do. So some of the worst offenders environmentally have been Christians in the name of God using that passage. Turn the page, if you will, because any verse that you don't get in context is usually a wreck. Skip to chapter 2, because he's going to define a bit more about what it means to subdue. In chapter 2, skipping down to verse 15, he says, The Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Or literally, to cultivate it and to take care of it. It was to steward. It's the idea that he would take something, and you have this huge opportunity and authority over this precious possession, and you have this huge responsibility to care for it the way I would care for it. Um, again, early, early days, Therese and I uh, were on this journey. We took everything we owned, we put it in a rider truck, uh, we put our car in the back of it, and then we went to Texas to prepare to go into the ministry, which was very new for me. I was a basketball coach. And I didn't, we had $700 to our name, we did not have a place to live, and I didn't have a job. But other than that, we were really set for this new adventure. And so uh, there was a missionary there who said, look, we're going to be out of, the, out of the country for six to eight weeks. Um, you can put all your stuff, because it was in a truck, we had to unload it, put it in his garage, and you can just live in my house. You can have dominion over my house. You can use my refrigerator. Uh, we have some fruit trees in the back. You have complete dominion over my house. My car's there. If you need to use it, it's yours. I had this huge opportunity. And it was fun, and, you know, I found a bunch of part-time jobs, and we eventually found a place to live, and it all worked out well. But during that time, to get all of our stuff in his garage, I had to take his car and, and park it on the side of the road. And it was parked at an angle, and I think that was part of it, and the Texas sun was really hot, and I didn't ever think about one of those shade-type things. So for six weeks, his car didn't move with the sun coming at a certain angle. Well, when I went to take the car and put it back in the garage, you know the part that does the windshield wiper and all that was melted together. We have a very big problem because I started with $700 to my name. Well, I don't have $700 now, and I've got to make a payment to get in that apartment that we're going to have. And, and I checked on it, and I found out it's a whole part, and it's like a $139 part, which back then was a lot of money. And then I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I can't leave this messed up. And I had a miracle. It's one of the early miracles of my life. I, I went to a junkyard, and I, I showed them. I, I actually took, I, I got screwdrivers out. It was scary. I'm not mechanical. And I pulled this thing off, and I took it to a junkyard filled with all these wires. And I said, I need one of these. And the guy went out and pulled one of these off. And I brought it back, and I had no idea what I was doing. But I thought, well, I bet the red wires go with the red wires, and the green ones go with the green ones. And I, I'm serious. And I put it all together. I stuck it back, and it worked. And it was like... Lord Jesus, after I'm, and my, my wife probably said there was the Red Sea and there was Chip doing that. But, but here's what I'm going to tell you. It never entered my mind that after he gave me dominion over his home that I would leave his car in a way that didn't work after I left. Are you starting to get, I want, to, I want you to get the emotion and the feel of how your heavenly father feels and thinks about this environment and this planet, that he gave you dominion. You have power to subdue, but to cultivate and to care for it. You're a vice regent. You're a co-creator. You're a caretaker. Third, we learn from scripture that the earth has intrinsic value and reflects the character and the beauty of the creator. The earth, nature. It has intrinsic value. Notice what the scripture says in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Look at the verbs there. Look at the verbs of communication. They declare. They pour forth. They proclaim. They reveal. Yes, the earth is a gift from God with oxygen, plants, four-footed creatures that can become food. 
uh, creatures that you can put uh, heavy weights on so you don't have to care, uh, creatures that you can learn to cultivate. God gave us subdue, develop, use your mind, be a co-creator. We started out as just gatherers and hunters, and then we cultivated, and then we learned about seeds, and then we planted things, and then we took animals and realized that some of them we could actually create livestock on a regular basis. And then years later, we would learn through our minds and subduing and technology that there's things inside the earth that were valuable like metals. And God knew when he gave all of this that there was fossil fuels. And he knew that we would, we would have the ability to extract as we learn and grew because we're made in his image. We would constantly develop this thing called technology. But he says, those are to meet your needs, but what I created, I didn't, it's just not utilitarian. I created it in a way where there is beauty, nature, the earth, what you see, what you observe in and of itself reflects who I am. It's like if you see a great painting or you see a great sculpture or you go to a, a building that's just amazingly made, how that building is made tells you a lot about the architect. That painting tells you a lot about the artist. That sculpture tells you a lot about the sculptor. God says, I made this in a way to reveal my character and my beauty. I didn't have to have over, you know, two or three hundred kinds of beetles. I didn't have to make billions of galaxies. The Alps don't have to be that beautiful. The Grand Canyon doesn't have to be that breathtaking. I didn't have to make an ecosystem that is so delicate and so amazing that I had these little bugs that fly around and insects that take the pollen from here to here to here to here to make everything work. I can go thousands of feet down and see things at the bottom of the sea that look like creatures from outer space and... I can see breathtaking views of redwoods that are almost 300 feet high that were here for thousands of years. He says, all of those things are to reflect that I'm God, that I'm wise, that there's beauty, that I have power of falls in Victoria Falls in South Africa that just the roar and the rush and the beauty. See, God has made this for us to reflect who he is. Look at the implication. The implication is we're to explore, but not exploit. We're to enjoy, but not worship the earth. We're to explore that. Are you ready for this? Some of you, and especially some of your kids, you need to get outside. We're living in a world. We're living in a world where some of your kids... And some of you, this is your body posture most all the time. <laughs> right? Or some of you, there's stars at night. Trust me, they're out there. There's an ocean very close. There's flowers. Or I watch people now. Let's get out in nature. Here's how people take walks. <laughs> there is something that will shrink your soul when you don't explore what God has made. There's a part of what he's made is to comfort you. There's a part of the power and the wisdom and the beauty that gets soaked into your soul through nature. He speaks through his word, but he speaks through nature. He speaks to your heart. And some of that you need to be exposed to where you get this overwhelming sense of a God who created all those stars and billions of galaxies. Do you think he really has the power to help me in my marriage? To help me get a job? To give me the grace to forgive someone who hurt me? What do you think? You think as I see the rotation of the seasons and how things die and they come back to life that regardless of a big failure in my past or what I've done, that isn't God trying to tell me there's seasons of winter and death, but there's new life and spring? See, it's made to teach us, to renew us. The danger, however, is... Uh, we can get so involved in nature that we begin to worship it. It's from the beginning of time of all the things he said to Israel, worshiping idols, worshiping idols, and the sun and the moon and the stars. In fact, if you will turn to Romans, just 
middle of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, then hit Romans. Romans chapter 1, a second critical place where he talks about creation. Because here's what happens. When you focus on creation, 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 after a while you lose the creator. So places like Santa Cruz, Sedona, Arizona, Boulder. I could take you to a number of other places in the world that are just spectacularly beautiful. They always gravitate to New Age colonies. Because people who begin to worship the creation pretty soon lose sight of the creator. But when you begin to focus on the creator and see his creation, you get an accurate picture of his greatness and his wisdom and his love and his beauty. Notice what the, uh, the apostle Paul would write, Romans chapter 1, picking up, go down to about verse 19. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, well, how? How did God make truth plain to them? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, well, like what? His eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from that which has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were dark. And what God is saying is, enjoy, but don't worship it. The earth is not your mother. The earth is a created beautiful gift from your heavenly father to reveal his character and to provide for you and so he says okay i made it it belongs to me second i'm going to put you in charge of it you are a co-creator you're a vice regent you're a caretaker you're a steward and a manager of this creation that belongs to me and third don't get utilitarian it's not just getting wood out of this, and it's not just a piece of dirt. It's just not rocks here. It's just not food to do your own thing. I want you to pause and stop and explore the wonder of who I am through what I've made. Fourth, he says mankind is placed in the middle of the created hierarchy and is uniquely responsible to God above and for the animals, plants, and resources below. God made the planet and the earth. He said it's good. And it's interesting. We read it. It says, by his finger, he created the galaxies, the moon and the stars. But when God talks about creating you and me, it says he formed us with his hands and he, whoosh, he breathed life in us, into our nefesh, into our flesh. There's the creator. A little bit lower than the creator, there is mankind made in his image, unlike any animal or any plant. You can think and feel and reason. Stamped in you is the very image of God. You were made for relationship with him. Then there are animals, animate living things that have breath with purpose. And there's inanimate things like plants and trees and rocks. And right in the middle of that are you and me, mankind. And we have a responsibility and a stewardship upward to our creator and we have a responsibility downward to treat animals and plants and the rest of the creation with this delicate balance of using it for our good, productivity, and also preservation and restoration. So notice the passage here, Psalm 8. He says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, and then he, he ponders, he, 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 in the awesomeness of God, what is mankind that you're mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels, and notice the role that mankind has in the environment. And you crowned them with glory and honor. And you made them what? What's your role? Rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, the flocks, the herds, the animals, the wild things, the birds, the sky, the fish of the sea, everything that swims in the ocean. Message, all living things have value, but not all living things have equal value. The earth is not God. It is not our mother. It is a created thing. Whales and babies do not have equal value. And yet when we think wrongly about the environment, we kill babies and we save whales. Think of it. 
It's a theological issue. Should we save whales? Absolutely. But we, but we have movements in the environment, some of the environmental communities that, you know, your dog or your cat or this lizard has the same rights because it is a living species and you're just part of the living species and all of the earth is God. And therefore, when there's priority decisions, you have no greater priority than a dog or a cat or a lizard. That is not true. Now, what we're going to see is God will call us to be good stewards of those things. But animals don't have the same rights as humans. By contrast, here's the implication. We are to use, not abuse, animals, plants, and resources to glorify God. See, the Bible is so amazingly balanced. Over here it says, don't do that. And then over here, it'll say, yes, you're above the animals. And then Proverbs will say, a wicked man is cruel to his animals, but the godly are kind. Wicked people abuse the land, but godly and righteous people are good stewards of my creation.